I call the Thursday, October 6th, uh, Borough Council work session to order. Uh, Ms. Bryant, will you call the roll? Sure. Council President Fred Bush. Here. Council Vice President Michelle Panopoulos. Here. Council Member Barbara Fortner. Here. Council Member Rob McGrady. Here. Council Member Cindy Rickards. Council Member Bob Weisberg. I'm here on Zoom. Council Member Ira Winston. Here. Mayor Andrea Deutsch. Here. All right. Uh, are there any proposed changes or additions to the agenda tonight? Uh, Starting in, seeing none. Uh, our next uh, is, a, is a commendation. Um, so, who's the uh, one speaking here? Uh, I think it, if you wanted to, yeah. Uh, well, all right. So, uh, the skate park uh, was. Not originally an idea coming from council, uh, it came from the community. And uh, the community member uh, who brought this to council's attention and have repeatedly brought it to council's attention uh, is here today. So uh, we're very pleased at the way that the skate park has turned out. It's, it's been a great community focus and uh, it's, it's, it's worked extremely well. Uh, so we have a certificate of commendation uh, to present to Harry Quait today uh, for his you know, work in, in bringing the skate park to Narva. Uh, would you like to come over here? Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Congratulations and uh, thank you for uh, what you've done. You know, keep, yeah. Keep up the good work. Yeah, Thank we you really very appreciate it. We can't really claim you as one of our own since you're near. Yeah. yeah. But, we, 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 but you're, you're near enough that we are going to say you're a member of our community. Yeah. And I just want to personally thank you for really being a model of positive, positive advocacy. Like you never got frustrated when the state park wasn't coming together with any delays. You've just always brought yourself brought your family, brought your friends, brought your friends' families to show up and say, hey, here's why escape, here's why escape book would be so great, here's why we we'll build community and bring people together. And you were right. So mm -hmm. thank you thank for you. that. And on behalf of all the skaters, I want to say thank you to you guys for helping this be a possibility. Uh, so thank you. Thank you. You made it easy for us to vote yes. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I, I can't follow that in the comments. Um, Ms. Deutsch, do you have any comments? Uh, yes, I do. Um, uh, since um, August, uh, Sergeant Fernaccio has really assumed leadership of the Narvath Police Department. And I really, I just want to thank him so much for his le the leadership qualities he's shown and the way he's led the department. Um, he, he's really done a, a, a wonderful job and he's handled himself remarkably well. And I feel very confident in this interim period with him in charge. Uh, in that light, um, he has he's given me a couple updates to a few things that happened in the borough uh, since this summer. And I just wanted to update uh, everyone as to what's going on. So uh, in uh, in August, beginning of August, there was an incident in the park with some graffiti and some uh, some vandalism. And I want to congratulate the Narbeth Police Department. They have uh, they have cleared the case. The actors have been charged, and uh, and that matter has now been uh, closed. But thank you, uh, thank you to them for their good work in finding out who did it and and uh, filing the appropriate uh, charges. Um, also, uh, just a quick update. I want to. Um, I think everybody heard about the shooting incident that occurred. Uh, on September 21st. Investigations ongoing, um, but the in injured individual is out of the hospital and is recovering. Um, and I just want to give a special thank you to the officers that were involved, uh, particularly Dan Dutton, uh, Officer Belfi, and of course, Sergeant uh, Vernaccio. They've done, done a wonderful job. Also, a big thank you to the Lower Marion Police Department and the Montgomery County de uh, detectives who are helping to investigate the matter and will help uh, do what they need to do to, to bring this matter to a close. So thank you to them for all the hard work 
and uh, really much appreciated. And uh, that is it. Thank you, Mayor Deutsch. So let's move on to public comment. Uh, Mine will be three minutes. Uh, let's start with folks in the room. So I'm just going to point to it starting in the front row. Anybody public comment? Second row? Anybody wish to make public comment? Sure. Just state your name and your address. John Constantine, 400 Margaret Avenue. Coming up closer. So it could be heard because on the videos, it doesn't come through. Okay, go ahead. Um, I have a comment about the solid waste uh, fee calculation. I guess there's some effort to make it fairer. Is that the, the right reason well, for adjusting the calculation? So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that later on. Okay, um, but, but with, with regards to the calculation, um, I still have difficulty following the numbers. Um, it says there's 1,559 residential living units. Um, that may be physical properties. There's duplexes, triplexes, quadplexes. There's 1,900 plus families in the borough, at least per the census report. So these numbers don't quite add up. And then I also like to find out, does Republic actually provide that split? And if so, how? do they get to that split on the dollars there? Because when I see the trucks go by, you know, they're picking up everywhere. I don't know how they, you know, allocate the weight load and disposal, you know, to see that that's appropriate. And then within the non-residential units there, they have, or properties in that case, 123. I don't think it's fair just dividing it by 123. I mean, you have 300 North Narvith, I mean, 300 North Essex, that's 60 units itself. Montgomery Court and Narvith Avenue, Price Avenue, is at least 73 units. So are you saying they're only gonna be paying $1,200 when they have 60 units or 73 units? Uh, I believe that. Well, I, just want, I think I just want to remind everyone that this is public comment, not a public question and answer. All right, so we, we will go well, I'm making my comments yes. for you to That's find it. out the answers. All right. And then I'd also like to, I guess, echo the mayor's comments now about, you know, Officer Bernacchio doing a great job. Uh, you know, taking on the leadership role. Maybe we should think about, you know, doing that without a chief or making him chief, and and we can save several uh, hundred thousand dollars uh, if we need to additional forces. We can go with the Lower Marion. We've used them when we need fill-ins and stuff like that, right? We can. You're looking for for ways to to uh, save money, right? So you could do these other projects. Again, I'm not, 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 yeah, not, not going to do you. Yeah. And uh, I mean, in, in the packet itself, there was notation about <coughs> Republic services being looked at going to the, the township for, you know, utilizing their services. So we could utilize the police force as well from Lower Marion you know, to, to save money, you know, we, that's the biggest part of our budget, $1.9 million. All right, thank you, Mr. Constant. Time's expired. Uh, all right, anybody in the back row to make a public comment? All right, let's move to online. All right, so um, just a reminder for folks on Zoom, if you could either uh, use the raise hand symbol on Zoom or literally raise your hand, I will uh, call on you and you'll get a prompt on your screen to be able to unmute and provide your uh, three minute public comment. So the first hand I see raised is Carol Marie Scanlon. I'd like to echo um, our last speaker's frustration that we give a comment without an without a answer to it. Because sometimes these are just simple questions that could be asked and answered. <laughs> So as my public comment, I'd like to, first of all, add to Andrea Deutsch's comment and add Narberth Ambulance to their stellar service to Narberth, to the community during the incident that was recently, uh, the shooting incident that was recently happening. 
Now, I'd like to ask a couple questions about the master park plan. Is that still on the table for an ad hoc committee? Because I had heard in the recent uh, past that there was not going to be an ad hoc committee. So I'm wondering, is that back on the table? It's in the packet. And if there is the ad hoc committee, Friends of Sabine Park is a major stakeholder in Sabine Park and open space preservation for Narberth. Uh, and a representative from Friends of Sabine Park would like to be on the committee for the Master Parks plan. Now, how long do you anticipate the Master Park plan to take to accomplish the task of making the Master Parks plan with the surveys, the uh, town hall meetings and the interviews that are going to be done to find out what residents want for the parks? And how will the Master Park Plans Committee's job and timing work with the development plans of the Montgomery County Redevelopment Authority for 201 Sabine, as well as taking down the building uh, for that property? And do you have developments to share from the Montgomery County Redevelopment Authority? So if you're this is the questions that I have. And then another question I have is in regards to the EI team. Um, is this income stream going to be a direct line item in the budget, meaning the monies collected can only be used for the stated purpose category of infrastructure? Or will this money be put in the general fund? And I'd like to know when you when I could get answers to these questions. Are you, are you finished, Gallery? All right. Uh, the short answer is we have no news on the RDA at this time. And uh, other topics, so we do, we'll, we will be discussing um, the EIT later on. Uh, if I could just add maybe just one comment to maybe address some of the concerns from Mr. Constantine and, uh, and Ms. Scanlon. Um, so what we try to do during the council meetings is like I write down these questions as people ask them. And if it's an agenda item at the meeting, I do my best, you know, we do our best to address the question or concern that came up. And if it's something that isn't covered during the meeting, then I do, uh, you know, genuinely try to make it uh, an effort to, you know, get questions answered for people after the meeting. So I don't want people to think that like we're just like ignoring your questions. Yeah, and the Master Parks plan will come up at 9A in, in today's meeting, as you pointed out, Tomrey. Uh, any other public comments on that? Uh, let's see here. Uh, I don't see any uh, any other hands raised. All right. Let's move on to 8A, which is the preliminary plan preliminary plan for 146 Maryland. Thanks, Okay, already do you need a piece of uh, any equipment or what do you need? So cool. Could you present or uh, make Joe panels? Joe Hadley, so we chat. He's going to put the plans up for us. Uh, good evening, members of our council. Uh, shall I remove this while I'm speaking? Is that what If you'd of? like, all right. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh -oh. Leave it as a little uh, bit here. Uh, uh, thank you for uh, your consideration of this plan uh, this evening. Uh, earlier this week, we were before the Planning Commission, which uh, has uh, a lot of familiarity with this plan for a couple of reasons. Number one, we had been uh, before the Planning Commission as well as you previously to obtain approval of the tentative sketch plan for the development that we're going to be talking uh, with you tonight about. Uh, this is a preliminary plan. And during the uh, preliminary plan process, special attention is given to such items as uh, sewer connection, stormwater management, and landscaping, uh, and uh, other uh, miscellaneous provisions of the code that relate to uh, the preliminary plan approval. Uh, the plan has been reviewed uh, by the Montgomery County Planning Commission. Uh, by uh, your uh, staff, by the borough engineer, Pannoni, which uh, serves uh, uh, to provide advice both on the civil engineering aspects of the plan as well as on the landscape uh, portion of the plan. 
And uh, since uh, you have not seen uh, the preliminary plan and have not had the explanation of these various items, sewer, stormwater management, landscaping, we're prepared to do that to you this evening. And uh, we have a few different people who would like to make that presentation, uh, starting with our civil engineer, Chris Yon. Um, and uh, I almost forgot that uh, of great interest is the architecture of uh, of these new buildings and as you know we have an existing home that's going to be relocated uh, right next door to where it is uh, on marion avenue on the same lot but uh, slid over and where the home had been there will be uh, twins a, a pair of twins and on the rockland avenue side of the property there will be two new cottages and those new cottages are smaller units uh, which is nice uh, you're familiar with that that uh, it provides a, a nice new smaller housing option uh, for um, the two new residents uh, of those cottages. Um, and uh, there were comments that were uh, made by the Planning Commission. Mr. Bressy had prepared uh, the Planning Commission's memorandum to you. I trust that you've seen it. It's included in your package of materials. And the Planning Commission uh, has recommended uh, the approval of the plan. They had uh, a couple of comments and uh, were in full accord uh, to uh, comply with uh, those particular comments and we will uh, address them uh, this evening and uh, show you how we would do that. The other thing that we had uh, requested of the Planning Commission was that the plan be viewed as uh, both a preliminary and a final plan because with all of the work that has been done right from the beginning with the tentative sketch and particularly in connection with the new ordinance when uh, this uh, uh, site was very carefully analyzed and the new units that were to go on the site were very carefully analyzed. Uh, we uh, uh, really are at a point where we believe that all of the ordinance uh, concerns that relate to not only the preliminary plan approval but the final plan approval are addressed. And I think we uh, had uh, a concurrence uh, of that opinion uh, by the borough engineer, Eric Johnson, and uh, that was really the unanimous recommendation also of the Planning Commission that it be viewed uh, as a preliminary final plan. And of course, even a final plan is subject to conditions and uh, to a developer's agreement that your solicitor and and uh, staff uh, are very careful to make sure that uh, all of the uh, the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed before there is a, a sign off on the plans and a recordation of the plans together with the security that's required under the planning code. So with that introduction, I'm going to ask uh, Chris Yon to talk to you uh, a little bit about the uh, civil engineering, um, Jack Burns to talk to you about the architecture. I think these are uh, pretty exciting uh, new units and Bernd Panzak to talk to you about all the new landscaping that will be part of the project. So Chris. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, so last, as Fred said, last time we were in front of you, we had tentative sketch plans. It was a two page plan set. We now have fully engineered plans, which is a 10 page plan set, including uh, site plans and also the landscape plans. So Joe, if you don't mind switching to the first plan, thank you. So this is the illustrative plan sheet, which is just an overview, we have shows the buildings, uh, walkways, driveways, the buildings and driveways did not change at all from tenant sketch. There were a few minor tweaks to the walkways uh, and patios just to work with grading. You can see a couple stepping stones from the uh, cottage walkways over to the driveway. Uh, Joe, if you could switch to page two, is the record plan. This is what would be recorded at Montgomery County that has all the bulk zoning information, setbacks, property lines, meets and bounds. You could switch to page three, Joe. This is the existing condition slash demolition plan, which was part of the original uh, tentative sketch plan sheet, so this one didn't change. You could switch to the next one. Page four is the grading and utility plan. This is really where a bulk of the uh, engineering design is shown. And so we have utility laterals for each house, um, sewer, water, and electric. Um, one of the questions during tentative sketch is how we would connect the sewer for the Rockland Avenue homes. There was not sewer in front of the street. Uh, however, there was sewer uh, to the west down the street in Rockland, and there was also some a little uphill uh, on the eastern side right by the intersection with Rittenhouse. 
uh, we had got some extra survey information to determine which would be the better connection point, and we determined the one further down Rockland would be better. Uh, one, it's a, a gravity connection. We wouldn't have as many uh, crossings to cross, but it would also uh, allow for some other properties along Rockland to connect uh, from that other terminal manhole. We uh, added a retaining wall in between the Marion and the Rockland properties. We had had the first four elevations on the tentative sketch plan, but we really added more detail, one foot contours, spot elevations to show how all the grading would work around the houses and driveways. Um, we have the stormwater management systems are now fully designed, so there's a system in front of each building. Uh, we do meet all the borough required uh, volume and rate control. The systems along Rockland are a little bit oversized, so there'll be no overflow from those systems according to the uh, design requirements. The two systems on Marion will have a little overflow, and so we have an outlet pipe that is piped down in the right of way and connects to uh, an existing inlet in Marion Avenue so that any overflow would be piped to the inlet as opposed to going over land uh, over the sidewalk or in the street. Uh, and so that's a quick overview of that sheet that really has the bulk of it. I'm sure it looks like just a lot of lines and labels. I'm happy to go in any further detail on that or answer questions. Joe, if you don't mind switching to page five, those are really the, uh, the details for stormwater. That's a profile of the new um, sewer line in Rapid Avenue. If you switch to page six, this is the erosion and sediment control plan, which shows some of the during construction features like uh, tree protection fencing, silk fence, construction entrances, topsoil stockpiles, uh, things like that. We switch to page seven. Uh, the last sheet are really those erosion control details that are the standard county details. Mm -hmm. So that's a quick overview. I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, I think maybe we do our presentation first and maybe some of the other questions might be answered by another team member. But thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Jack Burns, Jack Burns Architecture. Uh, Joe, if you could continue the, the slideshow, please. Uh, what I'm going to run through are uh, floor plans of the, the different building types that we have out there and some elevation check compliance and <coughs> zero volatile features. This is uh, the basement first floor of the two cottages in the back. They'll be similar. There's going to be some grading differences around the perimeters, but they're going to be essentially the same building. Uh, front porch, little entry hall, powder room, basement access, living room, dining room, kitchen, and a one-car garage. We have a chain show. Slide that out of order. <laughs> this is the uh, elevations for the twins that are located in the front left of the property on Marion Avenue. You can see the party wall in the middle. Two front porches with steps running up to the front there. Um, and then on the right, you see the rear elevation of those with some corresponding grading. And then in the bottom left, we slightly cropped, but we have the compliance with the areas for the fenestration and the overall facade areas. Uh, next slide, please. Here is the second story of the cottage, uh, showing the front porch on the left, uh, master bedroom, bathroom, closet, and then two uh, bedrooms with a, a shared hall bath. On the right is the roof plan for those as well. Next slide. These are the side elevations of the twins that are on Mary Avenue. Mary Avenue will be to the left on the top one and to the right on the bottom. <coughs> so the bottom drawing shows the exterior face that's facing. And then here are the corresponding elevations for the, for the two cottages that they're visiting. Uh, next sheet, please. Uh, there's a series of drawings here with the existing home. We've had it surveyed, and here's some of the ideas. So this is the existing building as it stands right now. That's some preliminary ideas about how to stabilize. And again, we looked at it with the facade area and the fenestration details as well. Next slide, please. And here we have the Marion Avenue elevation at the top. <coughs> Show the two new buildings, and below we have the Rockland Avenue with the two cottages and some ideas about the materials on the exterior. Uh, Bern Panzak, landscape architect for the project. Uh, Joe, if we could go to the, well, uh, how about the illustrative plan? 
Okay, so you know we proceed through the ordinance, uh, look at requirements. Uh, we uh, take the, uh, the the site plan, and uh, then we apply the ordinance requirements to that. We've uh, been able to uh, preserve three trees along Marion Avenue. Uh, there are a few other trees along Lot Three in this area that will be preserved. Uh, we looked at sort of the setbacks and uh, utility impacts to trees and we believe that there's 30% uh, of most of these uh, existing trees to remain and we believe that uh, our um, development will allow those trees to uh, continue to uh, thrive in the areas that they're, they're in. Um, we then, you know, look at the various criteria and then apply them to the site. Uh, we've got a very uh, space efficient site where, uh, you know, hedgerows and uh, relatively tight uh, canopy trees would be appropriate. And uh, as Chris had said, there's a, a retaining wall uh, through the center of the site, splitting the Marion side from the Rockland side. Uh, and in an attempt to provide uh, privacy and buffering between the, the plans, uh, we've uh, arrayed a hedge along the backs of the properties, and we've also uh, um, done the same thing to a certain degree along the side property lines. Uh, we've uh, added street trees where street trees uh, will be appropriate and um, you know in I guess uh, Joe if we go to the um, elevations right this okay this is the uh, the Marion uh, Avenue side and uh, what we uh, believe is that this gives us a, a reasonable idea of what uh, uh, the streetscape uh, would look like uh, along Marion uh, with the, the, the duplex units, uh, lots three and two to the left and lot one to the right. The lot one uh, location is the existing home that will be moved from the middle of lots three and two to lot one. Um, the, the two trees that are sort of bracketing the, this uh, image are uh, two of the trees that are being preserved. There's one tree, uh, a street tree, that's approximately in the middle of the properties uh, that wasn't placed on this elevation, but that will be there and will remain. Uh, if we go to the next, Joe, this is the Rockland uh, elevation, and again, uh, depicting uh, street trees, other uh, required trees, uh, and uh, landscaping that's not necessarily part of ordinance requirements, but we wanted to add uh, some of the foundation landscaping and uh, hedgerows and things in there, just to give you an idea of how the rest of the project would uh, round out. Um, so we went to the Planning Commission. Uh, there was a comment about uh, the array of species that we were using. Uh, and uh, Joe, if we go to the, uh, well, yes, to this. Um, we felt like a response uh, to native species was uh, a, a comment that the Planning Commission made and that we are happy to revisit our plan. Um, what you see in uh, the, the light green or the lime green color are all of the, the species that were native, uh, that were included on the original um, uh, landscape plan. The, uh, the darker green in this case are native species that uh, we believe we can add to the plan, make it a better plan, a more native uh, species uh, heavy uh, plan. So um, there still remain a few uh, uh, hedgerows that are, are non-native and some of the concerns there were uh, shade tolerance and density and size and uh, we felt like having those remain uh, in uh, the species that we were proposing would be the best thing to do but we, we definitely uh, took the planning commission point of uh, 
you know, integrating more native species into the plant, and that's uh, what we've done. Uh, one additional thing uh, in terms of landscaping, uh, top left of the, of the sheet, uh, we do have a note there that says additional screen planting. This was an area that we did not have uh, plantings in the beginning, and uh, we also uh, felt like that was a good comment from uh, the Planning Commission, and we would plan to extend that uh, buffer along the western edge of Lot 1 uh, to mitigate any issues between Lot 1 and the neighboring property. And I believe with that, that completes my presentation. Thank you. Yeah, that that uh, completes our representation. Chris uh, had just uh, mentioned to me that, that in terms of the review letters that we are basically in a will comply status. All the comments that were presented uh, in both the civil engineering and the landscape plan reviews were uh, looking to comply with all of those. I should note also that there is a requirement that we go to the Shade Tree Commission. We had uh, expected to have been there before we were here, but that meeting got rescheduled for early next week, and we will appear before the, the Shade Tree Commission. And of course, their concern is the, uh, the street trees, the shade trees that are uh, along the respective streets. And uh, we certainly expect to have a uh, very good and cooperative discussion with that. So if there are any questions, we're all here to answer them. I should say that Summer Knight uh, is uh, also here, and uh, uh, she's, uh, as the owner of the property, has been uh, very attentive and uh, engaged in, in the process, and I think pleased with, with the outcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Rob. Uh, so I, I noticed the fireplaces are built in a way that uh, would accommodate a gas fireplace, looks like that is the setup with that external end. So I'm wondering if, if you can um, consider um, you know, um, an electric, electric construction. Oh, I, I'm certain that we could consider that, yes. As, as opposed to a gas powered Fireplace. Yeah, well, the gas power anywhere yeah. else. You know, we were very interested. That you can see from the planning commission in considering no gas hookups, you know, in the future. And this new construction will last for 80 years. So you're potentially locking in uh, fossil fuels that don't need to be there, right? I live across the street and our house is all electric. So we know it can be done with heat pumps and electric fireplaces. So I just ask you to consider. All right, uh, any other questions on that so far? Um, in the Planning Commission's letter to us, uh, one of the things that they recommended was that um, that the applicant investigate the use of green building practices and report back to council on those things at the time of final or, and I'm like, I don't know if that's supposed to be tonight or if that's going to come later because tonight we did get report on um, the native species, which they also had said council should see before final approval here, before final <coughs> approval. So I'm just wondering where that stands because that fits in very nicely with Rob's question. Yeah, and, and, and thanks. Uh, you, you caught us uh, an oversight. We had intended to address that. In fact, Jack uh, was prepared to address that. Jack. Oh, certainly. Uh, yes, we, we reviewed the draft, uh, the draft that's before everyone here, and there's a lot of great points in that. And the project really lends itself very well to doing things in a green fashion. Uh, relocating the existing building in and of itself is somewhat of a green action, you know, maintaining all those existing materials that were used years and years and years ago, which is fantastic. Um, some of the other individual items that we represented, like the, the carbon footprint stuff that we looked at in, in the column one, there were a number of items on that. Uh, a lot of them, in, in the, the, uh, sorry, the materials that we end up using tend to be within the 500 mile radius. Uh, in general, the heavier materials tend to be from closer to where you are. So, uh, windows, concrete, blocks, things like nuts and bolts type building materials tend to be from somewhere close by, which should be pretty easy for us to comply with. 
Uh, one of the other items was the EV vehicles, and for the two cottages, I, it, it seems like commonplace at this point to leave a circuit of some kind available for an EV vehicle that may be used. So we'll be making allowance for that the electrical panel, and then whoever, whatever specific model they have, then we ready to plug right into the wall. Uh, and then some of the other ones which are kind of common sense, but you know, simplifying the structure of the building, we strive to do that anyway. <laughs> it's cost and green sometimes go hand in hand, so that's something we can certainly do. Um, yeah, I think those are the high points of what we've looked at. Just, just to follow up, you're, you're planning to heat all of these properties with gas, and, uh, gas water heaters, gas uh, heat for the homes. We have not made any commitment to a system of any kind as far as that type of thing goes yet. Okay. We're certainly, there's still very much <laughs> buildings without interiors yet, I guess at this point. The nature of the submission process, we're back and forth a lot, so we're, we're, we're moving into that the further along the process we get. I think it would make it would it would yeah. dovetail very nicely with the borough's plan for being renewable by is it twenty thirty right? Um, if this was if this any new construction, but especially these were um, not with gas or other fossil fuels, it'd be wonderful. So. Mm -hmm. Heard I, I heard you. <laughs> right, thanks. So the other sort of unusual ask is to consider the preliminary plan also as a final plan. Uh, and we see that, so Planning Commission has recommended that we consider this preliminary plan as a final plan. If anybody has concerns or questions about that concept. Now obviously this plan has, has gone back and forth with, between the borough and, and the design group for quite a while now. So there's been a lot of oversight uh, on this project from the Planning Commission presented to us several times. So yeah, I can see where the request comes from, but it is a change in our usual procedure. So just want to make sure everybody is comfortable with that. Looks like everybody is. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, any other questions for the, the group here? All right. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. 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 All right. Up next is AB, uh, Master Park Plan, Bad House Committee, and DC and our current opportunity. Samantha? Yeah, sorry. I was just throwing off the uh, Zoom there. Okay. All right. Uh, so included in your uh, packet, uh, was a memo recapping uh, the last uh, Parks and Recreation Board meeting where uh, where this idea was discussed. Uh, to go back in uh, history a little bit here, uh, Council back in May had uh, considered uh, the creation of an ad hoc uh, Master Park Plan Committee based on a document that was provided to Council by uh, the previous Park and Rec Board a number of years uh, prior. Um, given the uh, changeover in the membership of the Parks and Recreation Board, there wasn't an opportunity to implement uh, that plan. And given that a uh, number of the members, or pretty much almost all the members, who were involved in writing the original document that recommended the creation of the Ad Hoc uh, Master Park Plan Committee, uh, were no longer involved in the Parks and Rec Board. So the question was posed to the new members of Parks and Rec Board that they would like to directly be involved in master park planning or if they would like to you know, continue with the concept of council forming an ad hoc master park plan committee. Uh, the group had a really good discussion on it and they found that a number of their members would not be able to participate in the uh, time uh, commitments required to doing the master park plan. Uh, so they did recommend in favor uh, of council forming a master park plan ad hoc committee. However, they did ask council to uh, consider, instead of only appointing uh, one member of uh, Parks and Rec to it, 
uh, to allow the four members of Parks and Rec who are interested in serving on it to participate. And those members are uh, Dennis Brogan, Gene Burock, Dennis Callen, and Chris McLeod. Um, and to go back to my original memo and answer a couple of the questions that Carol Marie asked us, uh, as the original memo notes, uh, the anticipated time commitment uh, for master park planning is 12 to 15 months. So that would be about the time frame it would take uh, to get that uh, plan taken care of. And then also notes further down in the original main memo uh, that one of the duties of the committee would be to interview stakeholders that have an interest in a robust park system, including but not limited to the Norbert Business Association, Cycling Club, New Horizon Senior Center, and the various youth uh, and adult athletic groups. So if you know council does appoint this body, you know they'll make those decisions about interviewing stakeholders and gathering that uh, information for the master park plan. Um, and then maybe. Um, uh, the second component is in regards to funding the master park plan, but I don't feel me to hold off on that while we make sure council is good with the, <coughs> with the master park plan committee concept, or do you want me to go and talk about the grant as well? We, we can break it up. All right. So the idea is we're going to have a, you know, a group composed of you know, volunteers from boards and commissions. Um, and Parks and Rec obviously wants to take a, a significant role. Uh, Michelle, oh, the recommendation was originally, I think, for um, for the board to be composed of a, of a representative of the Shade Tree Commission, Planning Commission, Norbert Athletic Association. We called for two council members and one odd member from the Parks and Recreation Board. So I think if we do four members, we still have an odd member, which isn't actually for an committee. I'm really voting is. I'll let Greg will have an odd number of years because it's a consensus um, recommendation typically. But, um, you know, that would be nine. That's probably about as large as you didn't want. And I mean, maybe, you know, this I guess we just bought for the size of the, those kinds of committees, and it's, I don't know exactly what it is for this, but that's probably the, the outer boundary of, of what you could do. Um, so, I mean, I'm, I would prefer to you know, to myself, personally, I mean, prefer to go with parks and recreation. It's, you know, desire I have a lot of representation on the board, and I think that that's fine. Um, anybody else have a lot of time to do? Does, any, does, 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 does anybody have any other thoughts about the composition of this board? You know, you had some time to think about it for a few minutes since this memo was first um, put, put before us. I guess the one thought I have is if if, we, if it is going to include two members of borough council, are there two people who are like, yes, I want, I, I have the time for that. So that, that would be the, the only question that I would have. Um, and, but I, I, I like the idea of, you know, having, I, I'm perfectly comfortable with the idea of, of following the Parks and Rec's recommendation for the four people who would like to be on it. It makes sense to me to have, I mean, that's part of the reason we have the Parks and Rec board. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think perhaps one council member might be sufficient for the I think, yeah, I, I don't think it's critical to have an odd number in yeah, this case, so. Yeah. Well, and then we have the, we have the request from Friends of Save Park to be uh, part As of the As a stakeholder. Yeah. I would, um, like I said, we had a, you know, uh, we had a you know, big conversation in May uh, when we first talked about this idea about, sorry, about who all should and shouldn't uh, be on it. And again, like I said, I really tried to talk through a council then, and I'll really emphasize now, again, this concept of being on the committee versus being a stakeholder. And I think that, um, I think that we did a pretty good job of, of identifying, of doing a good job of identifying who should be in each of those roles. And I'm recommending, like I kind of said earlier, I think that uh, Friends of Savon Park, I think, you know, getting their input would be great. And I think doing it uh, as part of the stakeholder process would be, I think, would be the ideal way to do that. All right, well, I'm seeing a, a lot of nods around the table. So uh, I think we can proceed with the idea of the committee as uh, laid on the memo with the minor changes. Uh, 
to the membership. Okay, the, the, four, the, the request from Parks and Recreation had four members seem to reach So we'll, we'll be reaching out to the NAA Planning Commission and Shade Tree to see if they each have a willing and willing <laughs> participant. <laughs> no. I, I think yeah. Shade yeah. Tree might not be. It might not be quite their thing. I mean, their trees in the right away primarily, but. Well, maybe what we can do is I can um, yeah, reach out to the chair, the chair of the Shade Tree Commission, Planning Commission, and the executive director of the Athletic Association, uh, confirm their ability to participate, and then come back to council with that information. And then at that time, council can appoint the members of the committee as well as determine the count, what council member or members will be on it. Okay, sounds good. Thanks. Let's talk about the money. <laughs> <laughs> sure. So, uh, you know, doing uh, doing master park planning is not a uh, you know, not a, not a frivolous uh, expenditure by any means. So, um, you know, based on my past experience, having done one in my last job relatively recently, and um, Parks and Rec uh, early uh, this year actually did hear from a um, park banner who submitted a uh, scope of work and cost estimate. Uh, based on all that information, I think we would be looking at around 70000 for a master park plan. Um, that being said, I'm hopeful we can do it with very little uh, borough taxpayer funds involved. The funding strategy that I'm proposing for it is uh, DCNR of the State Department of Conservation and Natural Resources has announced a uh, special one-time uh, grant round. Usually their grants are in the spring. Uh, which part of what kind of messes up on our time frame for master park planning when we talked about it earlier this year but the timing of this grant is kind of perfect for what we want to do um, that would cover um, up to 80 percent of the cost of the master park plan for us uh, so that would leave a borough match of fourteen thousand dollars so if you could say 70 take 80 percent off that's fourteen thousand uh, in addition at the exact same time here uh, PICO has their Green Region Grant Program going on, uh, which provides up to $10,000 for various um, park and open space related expenses, including planning. Um, so if we were able to get both the PICO funding and the DCNR funding, the actual borough taxpayer expense of a master park plan would only be $4,000. Uh, um, so uh, the Parks and Rec Board, I had a chance to discuss it with them. Uh, I think uh, uh, I might have been dreaming this, but I'm pretty sure last month's F and A meeting we talked about grant strategy, and uh, and this concept was discussed as well, and, and all those groups were on board with it, um, and so I've I've agreed to a request from the Parks and Rec Board uh, to write up a draft grant application. Uh, thankfully, even though it's two different grants, since it's for the same thing, you know, you can copy and paste a lot of the uh, a lot of the material. Um, so um, my hope would be part of this. The PICO grants due, which we'll talk about a little bit later in the agenda, but um, it's actually due um, at the end of next week. So council would need to approve a resolution. I've been working on it a little bit longer than I've been waiting until tonight to start working on it. Um, uh, council would need to pass a resolution tonight in order for us to be able to submit that grant application. And then the DCNR grants due at the end of the month. Um, so Parks and Recreation would have a chance to, um, well, they'd have a chance to review both of the grants before they're submitted at their meeting on the 12th, and then Council could get a final review, at least on the uh, DCNR grant, um, before that's submitted before the 27th, if we're all good with that. Do you have questions about this or concerns? All right. Okay, so sounds good. This will be coming up again as action item 9A. Uh, for that resolution uh, that Samantha just mentioned. Okay. 2023 budget. All right, I should, uh, I should have brought a glass of water with me here uh, here tonight. I know, I'll just, I'll just kind of give a public heads up. I'm getting my uh, screen ready here to share so we can all kind of, you know, if you're, uh, if you're playing along at home, you can keep up with what we're uh, talking about here. Um, I'm not going to, there's 50 slides in this presentation. I'm not going to go through all 50 slides in detail. 
Um, a lot of these slides were created to provide reference for council and the public about how certain borough revenues and expenses uh, work and definitions of things. Um, so I'm really just going to try to focus tonight on some uh, you know, big picture sort of themes and some of the major decisions I need some input from borough council on in order to continue working on the budget and have a, uh, have a more defined uh, budget document for you all to review at your November work session. Um, that's the work session. Sorry, I'm scrolling through all the 146 Marion documents we got. Um, you know, my goal tonight, as like with last year, is not to get deep, deep into the numbers tonight. That's really what I prefer to do at the November uh, meeting. Again, really the goal, there we go. Really the goal tonight, again, is to talk about um, sort of big picture budget situation and, and get a sense of council's uh, funding priorities for 2023. Share my screen here so that everyone can match people here, that everyone can see it. Sorry, I got a little bit of a Zoom lag going on here. There we go. All right. All right, so uh, talking about 2023 budget tonight. Um, again, I'm not going to read everything on this slide. I just want to note that for the benefit of the public and council, you know, these are, I like to start on a positive note. These are the things we've uh, accomplished already this year, and these are the sort of things that, um, you know, people's tax dollars, they deserve to know what, you know, what sort of things they've been accomplished with them. And, you know, this is uh, a list uh, not of everything we've done, but of some, uh, some highlights here. Um, as we talked about last year, I try to base uh, funding decisions uh, based on the various plans the borough has created, most notably the comprehensive plan, but also uh, as well as you know, the climate action plan, the pavement improvement plan, uh, so on and so forth. Um, the one caveat I'll note is that um, some things that are really important for us to do are not explicitly listed as an action item in the uh, comprehensive plan, like repairing sewer lines, which we'll talk about later on. Um, but I think we can agree those things are important. Uh, so in general, to the budget, we're going to talk a little bit how we're doing so far this year. Uh, if council made no, just left the borough on autopilot for next year, how the budget would do next year, and then talk about uh, what tweaks we want to make to that baseline budget based on the budget requests we've gotten, and then what's going to happen after tonight with the budget. Uh, I'm going to reference at various points the GFOA, that's the Government Finance Officers Association, which is the main, uh, you know, sort of body that finance professionals turn to. Um, I do want, I'm not going to read all this, but I do want to spend a minute on this slide. Um, you know, an unfortunate kind of thing about the way my job works is it's, I only have to come to council when I need to ask you for more money or for things that weren't allocated in the budget. And it's unfortunately rare where I have to come to you all and ask for something that would save the borough money. Um, so I want to make sure council and the public knows that I'm, we're not constantly like, you know, blowing through the budget and going over budget here. There's a lot of things that the borough is trying to do to be more efficient with taxpayer dollars and, um, you know, be really mindful of that responsibility that we have with them. Um, so I do have this slide here that uh, mentions some of the larger uh, things that we've done um, to uh, be more uh, efficient with tax money. Um, there's a chart here that I got, and again, just kind of show where we're at. Um, again, it kind of shows we're not just like recklessly spending everyone's money. I'll just note from this uh, chart here, the bro is uh, as of 2020, which was the most recent year that data was available statewide, uh, the borough was 20th out of the 63 municipalities in Montgomery County uh, in regards to tax expenditures per capita. And, um, and then honestly, the only reason we're even that high is because, you know, certain municipalities, especially the further away you get from the city of Philadelphia, don't offer as many services as municipalities closer to the city do, such as um, libraries, uh, police, um, and, uh, and other sort of services like that that are expected of municipalities like ours. 
So I'm going to honestly skip most of these slides. Obviously, when I'm done, if we have specific questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer them from council. But basically, what I tried to do over these next few slides is, again, more of a reference for everyone is to outline, you know, what are, again, what are different departments? You know, looking at those categories the state has of comparing municipal spending, uh, you know, how are we spending our money? And I also just kind of wanted to show the human element here uh, to make sure everyone in the public knows who the people actually providing these services for them are. So we have uh, pictures in here of uh, uh, the folks in the borough making those things happen. Uh, in case you're wondering on this picture, that is a picture of an actual uh, Narver Borough uh, sewer line <coughs> that, uh, that uh, broke uh, earlier this year and uh, Public Works had to fix. Um, the flip side of the coin is not just reducing expenditures, but it's how do we raise revenues uh, without you know, creating new taxes on people and how do we ensure that everyone is paying their, uh, their fair share. Um, so something we, you know, uh, so again, this list is here for a reference of, of the sort of things we've done uh, to try and, try and do that. And again, in the same sort of, uh, same sort of chart as before, this is a chart showing um, how our different revenue sources uh, compare to uh, other places, uh, you know, in the county and the state. And then, uh, I do actually want to talk for now on property taxes because they are such a you know large portion of our total budget. Um, you know, this is an obligatory slide that every municipality has in every budget presentation, uh, but I, I do feel like I need to do it every year. So, just a reminder to the public: when you pay your property taxes, you know, keep in mind that of them, you know, this chunk here are the taxes you pay to the school district. And then this chunk here is what the borough is uh, getting. Um, the school district is completely independent of Narber, they are their own governing body. So. Yeah, so the school board decides what those, uh, what those rates are. Uh, the only portion of this thing that borough council has say over is this part in the middle here. Um, you know, and then just looking at our tax rate, um, we haven't raised property taxes in three years now. Um, and this chart kind of shows just over time in general, uh, the borough has done kind of consistent, um, in terms of millage, um, relatively small uh, millage increases from uh, year to year. Um, the other half of how much money the borough gets from property taxes and, and what people pay isn't just our millage rate, it's what the assessed value of your property is. So I have a little definition about that. The main thing I want to emphasize to council and the public is that um, we don't, the, the assessed value of a property does not change when it gets sold. The assessed value of property only changes when there's significant uh, construction uh, on the property. So every month, the borough sends a list of our building permits to the county. They decide which ones seem large enough to warrant a reassessment, and then they go to the property and do the, uh, do the reassessment. So on that note, <laughs> uh, this chart shows the total assessment value in the borough of all the properties uh, historically. Um, this chart only goes back to 2019, but you see 19, um, that should say 20, not 22 and 2021 are relatively flat. And trust me, if you take this chart back before 19, it's, it's pretty flat uh, as well. However, in 2022, you see that there was this uh, chunk added onto it here. And uh, that was the result of um, 114 Forest, primarily the, uh, the Elm uh, apartment building. Um, so right now for the 2023 budget, uh, again, because it's a baseline budget, it does not include any new revenue from um, from uh, 100 Forest, 203 Haverford, or uh, 650 Montgomery Ave, um, just because those projects two are under construction, one hasn't started construction. And as we get further into the budget process and we get a better sense of when those projects might get completed, we can make a better decision as to whether to include revenue from those properties and how much in the uh, 2023 budget. Uh, again, we just have uh, 
you know, again, general slides about how uh, the borough's uh, various fees work. We are going to talk in detail about uh, my proposal for solid waste fees and try to address some of the questions Mr. Constantine raised about that. And of course, we are going to talk in detail, uh, a bit more in detail, about the earned income tax. And during that time, I'll try to address the question that, uh, that Ms. Scanlon raised. All right, so just a quick reminder, uh, like I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, the baseline budget is what the 2023 budget will look like, and we just kind of you know, continue the borough as is, as of our last council meeting. Uh, and basically, it just has the stuff that uh, either we, that we, that council up through September has obligated the borough uh, to have to uh, pay. Um, and I do want to note, even though it's October 6th, those uh, financials are as of August 31st. Um, just with the timing, getting bank statements and stuff, I finished up. Um, I finished up bank reconciliations today, but I won't have I won't have a chance to do the treasurer's report until early uh, next week. So, of course, when we do the November uh, meeting, we'll have you know much more updated financials. Um, before we dig into those financials, just a quick note about how the borough financial structure works. Uh, we use fund accounting. We have certain revenues and expenses that can only be paid out of certain funds, and thus the borough, uh, you know, the expenses and revenues of the borough are broken up by those uh, by those funds. Um, something we talked a bit about last year that's going to be important to talk about again this year is our fund balance policy. Um, which is that the borough needs to have enough money set aside in each fund so that it can pay expenses throughout the year because our revenues don't come in consistently throughout the year, but uh, especially in the general fund, we do have bills we have to pay every single month. Um, in addition, it's money that's there if, you know, if some sort of disastrous situation happens in the borough, we have money on hand to handle, uh, you know, handle that. Um, there's no set amount for each, for all funds there's no set amount, but each fund has its own fund balance needs that we'll talk about as we go through each fund. Uh, so the general fund, uh, that's the largest fund in the borough, it's the one where basically anything that isn't obligated or committed to another purpose is in the uh, general fund. Um, with two exceptions, uh, the borough's uh, state fire aid and pension aid that we get does get deposited into the general fund, and we are required to pass the fire aid on to the fire relief company, and we're obviously required to use state and pension aid to um, pay towards our contributions to employee pensions. Um, I'm recommending at this time, based upon the cash flow uh, needs of the general fund, that it keeps a fund balance of a million dollars. We have about four, about four million, uh, four point five million in expenses out of the general fund each year. Uh, you know, so that would keep us uh, above the GFOA recommended amount. Um, I give a lot of credit to prior council and management for really, uh, you know, getting the borough to a place to build up that fund balance. And I was thankful that council approved um, my recommendation to use the federal uh, COVID funds that we received to bolster that fund balance and get it to a healthy level. Um, you know, whereas in the past, the borough would have to do what's called a uh, tax anticipation note, which basically is the equivalent of a uh, municipal payday loan. Um, so I'm very glad and, and thankful, um, like I said, to council and past management for getting us um, out of that situation. And certainly not a situation I would ever want to see us uh, return to. Um, so looking at the general fund uh, for the rest of the year, um, it's expected to have uh, revenues that exceed expenses of about $60,000 at the end of the year. Um, I'll actually say that since then, we've had a number of other positive impacts to the budget. Uh, if I was betting right now, I bet we're probably looking at more at $100,000 um, revenue exceeding expenses at the end of this year. Um, and just for reference, that's about what we uh, budgeted um, for this year. Um, we had a large expense that we were thought we were going to pay at the end of 2021 that ended up coming into play at the beginning of 2022 is the main reason why we got off track from that uh, budget figure. Um, and I get some of the reasons uh, why, um, uh, why, you know, why we're kind of ahead of budget here. 
Um, unfortunately, you know, they're, they're not really uh, necessarily sustainable things, which is important to consider for the 2023 budget. Um, you know, real estate transfer taxes, we can't control those from year to year. And, you know, I know there's maybe a negative outlook for the real estate market uh, next year with the interest rate increases and all that. Um, business privilege taxes, again, we're ahead of estimate. Um, ditto with parking meter revenue. Um, we also got some pretty substantial um, insurance payouts from consolidating some life insurance policies that we can't repeat in the future. And then one of the, another huge thing that happened, which I certainly don't want to repeat next year, is uh, various staffing shortages. Um, I'm happy maybe to talk with Mr. Constantine another time about uh, about uh, you know why the borough is uh, looking to replace the chief as opposed to um, recouping those savings. Um, but just for tonight, that's outside the scope of this. But I'm happy to chat about that uh, at another uh, at another time. Um, so basically what happened is a lot of those savings, uh, you know, we unfortunately as well had a lot of unplanned expenses this year related to um, related to our uh, capital, uh, you know, capital items. And, um, you know, part of part of the challenge of the borough has been keeping up with our uh, infrastructure needs and our um, capital needs. You know, basically every car that the borough owns just about, you know, uh, broke down this year and had to be replaced pretty much. Um, you know, we had to spend $500,000 this year replacing the um, air conditioning uh, system here at 100 Conway. Um, last year, we had the roof and the boiler go over at 8 Windsor that had to be replaced. Uh, infrastructure uh, last week talked to our engineer about how the boiler here at this property is at its end of life and is going to need to be replaced in, uh, in the near future. Um, you know, so we've had a lot of situations like that come up that we didn't have a choice and, and had to uh, fix, uh, which will factor into the EIT that we'll talk about uh, later. So the baseline budget for 2023 um, calls for the general fund uh, to have revenues that exceed uh, expenses uh, by $13,000. Um, so that is a certain sense of good news and that uh, and at least we're starting off with a positive figure, albeit a not very uh, large one. Um, the challenge that we're going to talk about is looking at the different uh, proposals we've received for the budget. If council were to approve all of those, uh, you would then have expenses exceeding revenues by uh, $260,000. Um, that would leave us above the recommended million dollar fund balance, but not by much. So that's something you know we're gonna have to kind of talk through and figure out what our comfort level is, and then also evaluate the proposals on their own merits to determine uh, whether it's appropriate to fund them. Um, I'll also just very briefly note that um, uh, after this slideshow was done uh, earlier this week, I did also receive a uh, request from the, for the general fund from the Narbert Fire Company. And um, uh, my uh, hope and expectation is maybe the Public Health and Safety Committee can dig a little more into that and then come back to Council next month with, um, uh, with a recommendation on that, if that works for them. Um. All right. So talking about what some of those uh, specific requests are, some of these we're going to get more into detail on. Uh, for example, the EIT, we're going to talk more in detail about. Um, the homestead exemption, we can talk more in detail about. Um, but as we talked about before, we talked about implementing a, a local service tax. Um, looking at our fee schedule, um, something we're doing annually now to make sure that our expenses are being recouped by those fees. Um, it looks like we do and should uh, increase uh, subdivision and land development application fees. Uh, we also had the idea of last year creating an escrow for those, uh, for those projects to make sure the borough isn't uh, left holding the bag, so to speak, when one of those, uh, if something goes wrong with one of those projects. Uh, however, talking with our auditor, um, in last year, there were new accounting standards passed that would require the borough uh, to basically set up separate bank accounts for each escrow. And so uh, given that, you know, uh, as far as I'm aware, in the last six years, the borough has only had one project where the developer uh, kind of left the borough dealing with the engineering and legal review expenses. 
and uh, the amount of costs that would incur on the borough to have to set up separate bank accounts for every escrow, I'm now recommending that we not uh, require uh, those escrows. Um, the EAC had asked that we consider uh, eliminating um, building permit fees uh, for green building compliant projects. Last year, council approved waiving those fees for um, alternative energy pro projects, um, but the EAC had asked that we go a little bit uh, beyond that. Um, I realized when we did the fee schedule that we did not actually, on the fee schedule, have uh, the double permit costs for projects started without a permit. And we do have two or three of those we find out about uh, each year. Um, this might be one council wants to talk through a little bit more. Um, a fee for a certificate of appropriateness. I know one of the things we had talked about the HARP was not wanting to put uh, undue burden on people. Um, however, I will note that our, uh, you know, our zoning officer does have to review those um, applications and the borough does uh, you know, get a, a charge for that. Uh, so I would just ask if council has uh, any appetite for, um, for implementing fees to cover some or all of those costs. Uh, another big thing we'll talk about later in more detail is uh, the creation of a green fund. Uh, we had talked a bit about that last year and just with me being so new, just really <laughs> had time to implement that. But having had a full, uh, full calendar year uh, in the borough, um, it's something I've had more time to work with the EAC and uh, with Councilmember McGreevy on. And um, so there's a proposal to create that. Um, however, to fund all the requests in the green fund, uh, there would need to be a net impact of about uh, $88,000 uh, to the uh, general fund. Uh, let's see here. Um, to the question Carol Marie raised about the uh, earned income tax and whether it would be going into the general fund or not. Um, so again, not only with our funds, do they cover, the reason we have separate funds, like I said, is because they legally have certain funds, certain revenues and expenses that have to come out of them. And in the case of earned income tax, uh, it's not a uh, expense uh, that is, um, that is legally obligated to a certain purpose. So legally, I can't put it in the capital fund. Um, however, uh, I am proposing, you know, an estimated, um, you know, revenue in the first year. Uh, um, I am proposing that all the money from the EIT would go to the homestead exemption, and the remainder would then immediately be transferred to the capital fund. Um, uh, let's see here. Um, given the nature of inflation, I'm asking council to consider inflation-based uh, raises for non-contractual borough employees. Um, I'd also like council to consider the concept of uh, implementing non-contractual uh, merit bonuses uh, for uh, for employees. Uh, and just so you know, I mean, these are just by request. I recognize we're talking about a you know two hundred sixty thousand dollar expense over revenue. So there are certainly certain ones of these that I'm very open to talking of reducing or scaling back with for a council. Um, I was grateful to council that we had an intern this year. Um, I thought he did great work on the um, Peru website and the sustainability certification. Um, so I just wanted to ask council to consider having an intern again next summer. Uh, QuickBooks online, I meant to do this this year, um, and it just, it just didn't happen. Uh, council did budget for uh, for QuickBooks upgrade this year. Our current desktop version of QuickBooks uh, is at it's at its end of support phase. Um, I think I had previously proposed that we would upgrade to the next version of QuickBooks desktop. However, QuickBooks unfortunately has moved to a um, model. Uh, it used to be by QuickBooks desktop. It is also now a subscription-based model. Um, so if we're gonna be stuck in a subscription-based model, my preference would be if we have QuickBooks online, because right now that's the only thing staff cannot do, um, admin staff can't really do remotely is access our QuickBooks software. Um, we could even set it up, you know, or we could set up a, um, an account that would be like a read-only account if anyone uh, from council, uh, you know, at three in the morning wanted to check on a specific financial question or something like that, 
So, um, so something to consider. Um, we've been talking about moving from MailChimp for our uh, public communications to uh, Everbridge. Um, and that would be, thankfully, the county pays for that, so we would not have to pay uh, anything for that. Um, changing our IT vendor. Um, I'll be honest, I have not been uh, pleased over the last year and a half or so with the performance of our current IT vendor. Their contract expires uh, next summer, and at that time I would like to get proposals um, for an alternate IT vendor. Um, to her credit, Michelle Carroll, right before I started here, um, summer of 2020, spring 2021, had looked into getting alternate proposals. And uh, the company we currently use was the cheapest proposal. Um, however, it increasingly feels like a situation where the borough is uh, getting what it's paying for in that regard. Um, and I'll be happy when that time comes, or if you have more questions about that, I can give some specific examples of where, um, where we've had challenges with the IT vendor. Um, myself and uh, Michelle Carroll have uh, just some sort of standard uh, training requests. Um, these are just the same dues that we've had before for APML. Uh, the uh, uh, Pennsylvania Association for Professional Municipal Management and the International City and County Management Association. As we discussed earlier tonight, $4,000 for the Master Park Plan, netting out the potential grant funds. Uh, the community library asked for an inflationary uh, increase uh, to the support the borough provides to them. Uh, the uh, Girl Scouts of Eastern PA that make use of the uh, West Wing of 80 Windsor asked if the borough would be willing to consider uh, going half uh, the cost with them to uh, repaint uh, that room. Uh, looking at the Nelson Nygaard study, and earlier this year, the parking committee had recommended in favor of the borough having uh, at least a uh, part-time uh, parking controller in addition to our full-time one. And, um, you know, while ultimately our original, um, you know, that, um, um, while we ultimately were only able to have that for a few months, um, I, I would still think that that's a sound idea and, um, and we want council to uh, you know, consider uh, continuing with that. Uh, also in discussion with our public works crew, given the borough's uh, acquisition of um, 3 Elmwood, given uh, the sidewalk inspection program, we really want to try and uh, make time for our GIS mapping of sewer and stormwater lines. Uh, they were asking for additional staff uh, support. Um, and again, I have costs here for either a full-time or part-time employee for that. Uh, the Parks and Rec Board uh, has been having some preliminary conversation about uh, creating rental fees for um, elements of using uh, Narver Park. I'm not sure if I have the right number or not for that one. I will probably take a closer uh, pencil uh, to that number. Um, just like um, this year, myself and our public works uh, manager are asking for funding to uh, stormwater cameraing and cleaning. Um, I'll note the cost of the um, full-time and, par full and part-time parking controller. Uh, those costs here uh, are, actually they are already net of uh, the amounts of revenue that we would potentially bring in from, uh, from hiring them. Uh, let's see here. Um, given the amount of time that staff spends answering questions and concerns about uh, trash, um, I wanted permission from council to take $4,500 from the solid waste fund to, uh, um, you know, to address some of those costs the borough incurs. Uh, let's see here. So this is still something that is definitely, uh, you know, subject to uh, to change. And again, this number would definitely change depending on what direction council wants to go in regards to changes to our residential parking program that we've had ongoing conversations about. Uh, and then finally, I did, um, sorry I didn't put it in here, I got a detailed, I don't even think the police just said training $4,500. I got a specific detailed list of each train they want to do. And uh, I could uh, pull that up and, and pull that up for council if you need that information. 
Um, so that is the general fund. I don't know if you want to stop there and just talk about the general fund, or do you want me to get through? The other funds are much more straightforward. If you want me to get through those, and then and then we can get into the request. Let's. Uh, why don't you go through the other funds? And then uh, yeah, they'll be they'll be much uh, they'll be much faster. Uh, so the sewer fund, that's the money we collect from people uh, the sewer fees based upon their uh, water usage um, that we use to you know, keep the sewer system maintained. Um, it has a very healthy uh, fund balance. Um, it's over $300,000. And I spoke with our public works manager about what the appropriate fund balance level uh, was. Um, in particular, that fund, Cash flow isn't really a big concern. It's really more we need money if a, if a sewer line breaks so we can immediately fix it. And he told me that <coughs> you know, he can imagine any uh, job that would be more than 150,000. Uh, um, so that's my recommended fund balance. Um, and if we approve the uh, request we have here, it would bring that fund balance down to 250. Um, which is well above that 150,000. Uh, and those uh, two requests are um, public works through their mapping project has already identified a sewer line on Haverford Avenue that they think needs to be uh, repaired, as well as continued funding for inspection and maintenance of our sewer lines. So the Solid Waste Fund uh, right now has a, a fund balance of around $150,000. I actually do think that fund balance probably needs to bump up a little bit based on our bills uh, from Republic. Um, so talking about the, um, the fee for a minute and uh, try to answer some of uh, Mr. Constantine's questions about that. So uh, the 1,559 residential living units uh, that came from our uh, tax collector's um, billing vendor. So the company she uses is actually sent out the tax bills. Uh, told us these are the number of properties that get tax bills uh, in the borough. Um, and this is based on county uh, information as well. Um, so basically what I did, uh, you know, part of the challenge with this, I will admit, um, I do think that Mr. Constantine brought up you know, a good, a good point, and that the way that this is structured, which is a product of how the public currently bills us, is for non-residential properties, yes, this does include um, the apartment buildings as well as the other commercial businesses. Um, you know, the apartment buildings were a particular challenge because the way our bill and contract with Republic works is for some reason, um, when Republic, did their contract a few years ago with the borough. They have, they estimated the borough has 2,100 units for trash service, which is not um, not the case. Even if you um, factor in all the apartment units, um, according to the uh, tax collector's uh, bill, billing system vendor, uh, total property, total living units in the borough is around uh, 1,900, which I think is closer to that uh, number that Mr. Constantine uh, cited. Um, however, I'll admit the first time I did the, and so the borough gets two bills from Republic. We get one bill for everything that's under that contract. Um, for some reason, after the contract was established, the borough realized it needed additional services from Republic, um, most notably the dumpsters and trash cans and things in the uh, commercial air for commercial properties. So, um, so now the borough gets a second bill from the public for to provide the trash service that we do for those properties. So the apartment buildings, I was stuck in a bit of conundrum in that, do I lump them in with residential properties or do I lump them in with commercial properties? And the challenge with that, and talking this through with, uh, with our tax collector and, and her billing vendor, if I had lumped them in with residential living units, um, the cost for that, for the apartment building would be far, far, far higher than what they're paying in the current village right now. Like Montgomery Court Apartments went from um, paying about $10,000 a year in solid waste to like $30,000 a year in solid waste. Um, so the least worst way of doing it 
And also, I mean, be, I mean, the fact they're paying, you know, I think that given what it costs to borrow, you know, twelve hundred dollars for commercial service, I did a little bit of googling as well. I mean, that's kind of in line with what commercial trash service uh, costs. Again, the main goal here is that properties in the borough, with like any fee, should be paying as close as possible as we can estimate the cost of providing the service to them. And so what I would offer to council and the public is that these fees would be solely for 2023, and then following 2023, we're gonna have either a new trash contract or we're gonna have um, or we're going to have a different service provider, whether it's the township or even possibly the borough um, doing it, depending on how everything works out with all that. So I would say in 2024, I could come up with, you know, not say these numbers aren't accurate, but I could come up with even more accurate numbers um, you know, after 2023 once we have, uh, you know, a different uh, trash contractor system in place. So this is your this is your best estimate of how to pass through directly the costs that the borough is getting from uh, from our trash hauler. Trash hauler is charging X amount per unit, and we are going to pass those the to pass those costs on to the uh, to the yeah. community directly. So that's that's where these numbers are coming from. They're coming directly from the, the trash hauler. Uh -huh. So we're not, we're not going to do questions at this time. Um, if you want to call, so Mr. Constantine, it's 136, which is much lower than the Yeah, and like I said, if you want to chat uh, after, um, like afterwards, I'm happy to, uh, you know, get an email or set up some time for that. Um, so for the solid waste fund, again, we have this proposed fee change, which would be a net, um, net neutral uh, for the borough budget. Um, and again, my previous request to take $4,500 from this fund and allocate it to uh, uh, to uh, the general fund to cover admin and staff time for answering trash questions and concerns. So, so we should also be clear that along with this change, we would be reducing the property tax millage. So right now, the costs for solid waste are coming out of property tax millage. Okay. So yeah, it's a two point two point one mils. Two point one mils. So we would be eliminating that uh, that from the millage. So the millage would go down, and instead there would be this fee that would be a, a flat fee. Um, so the you know depends on the value of the house, uh, what the effect is on the, on the homeowner. But the average property uh, in Narberth I think is over one hundred fifty thousand in value. So the average property would see may see a slight reduction. Yeah, and, and the other um, the other thing I would um, that I realized I didn't answer that was a question Mr. Constantine raised is the way Republic bills us, they don't they don't they don't bill us based upon the actual uh, usage of a property in terms of how much trash they produce. It's like if you're this type of property, this is you know, if you're under this one bill, this is your rate, and if you're under this other bill, this is the rate, it doesn't matter how much trash is being uh, generated. I have a question about that. So, it's, it, it, I have a first question, I might have some follow-ups, but <laughs> are we at liberty to just say, say with this Republic contract, they bill us X per unit, they have to the way they bill it, but for us, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's like a, an annual amount. Yeah. Are we at liberty to distribute that however we wish in terms of, uh, I mean, obviously, I don't mean grossly inequitable. Yeah. In other words, do you have to do it the same amount per per living unit or? So the are other challenge. Are you, would you be at liberty to do something like say, this is our commercial properties, we take that off. Okay, now this is what we know we for our room for residential. So we're gonna look at apartment buildings and say a hundred dollars per unit, right? Or something like that, per living unit in an apartment. So then we like calculate that and then take that out. And then what's left we distribute evenly through the, the remaining like non Yeah, so if percentages. council wanted me to do it that way, I could revise the fees and do it oh, that way. We're allowed to do it that way. Yeah. Okay, so. But. Just as long as, we just have to, and there's, I think you covered the important points. We, yeah, we just have to remember that the only info I have is the two bills from Republic, and then in terms of our actual billing system through the property tax bills, I only have five categories of properties to worry about. Apartments, residential, com uh, commercial, 
Um, well, an exempt and unknown, we don't get a bill. So we really have three categories. We have apartments, uh, commercial, and residential. Right, I mean, so in apartments, we know how many units are in each apartment, right? Yeah. So, I mean, even if I'm an open, I don't know if we should try and slice and dice this to where we're like, we're multifamily, exactly, I mean, you know, how many people are living in there, you know. But I mean, we could, if we're allowed to just take the apartments as a separate category and say like 100 bucks per living unit, and then that might sit better with people. Yeah, I could certainly I could certainly redo it that way. Instead of just doing residential and non-residential, I could certainly do residential commercial apartment. Thank you. So do the exempt properties have to pay for the trash? I mean, they're not paying millage, but they might have to pay the trash. So they actually don't pay sewer fees either right now because they because again our main our only billing method we really have is through uh, through um, property taxes. And I would say after twenty twenty three, I would say. For 2024, I think uh, I think I would certainly want to reach out to those exempt properties and give them kind of a year's heads up that you know yeah starting in 2024 they should be paying. We're not talking that many. We're only talking 16 properties, but um, they should be paying uh, sewer and uh, and solid and trash fees. Yeah. So I should make a couple notes here. All right, so let's let's let her get through the rest of the presentation and we can get more questions. <laughs> um, so the capital fund uh, that has the definition, capital projects are those uh, that cost at least five thousand dollars. Previously, it was twenty five hundred, but we had so many things that were falling under that amount. Um, and a list of some of the capital stuff we're doing right now. Uh, all right, so the challenge of doing fund balance in the capital fund is like every project in the capital fund has its own dedicated revenues and expenses. So I can't, there's there's no way I could tell you a total capital fund fund balance. I could tell you like for the Narva Path Bridge project, this is how much, you know, what our fund balance is or uh, for the fire truck, you know, what it is, but I can't tell you that for the whole fund. Um, so as discussed at the last uh, council meeting, uh, there's a multi-year uh, plan, uh, not that many years, over this year, next year, pretty much, from the police department to convert over to a um, all EV uh, patrol fleet, so that um, those costs are included here. Uh, the EIT revenue, that'll be going into the capital fund. Um, as we discussed with Public Works earlier this year, uh, this year they're getting a, um, a new truck to replace the one that broke down. Um, they also have another truck that is due for uh, replacement and is pretty much uh, off the verge of uh, uh, being uh, defunct. Um, thankfully, that truck, talking to the public works manager, has a decent um, resale value, though. Um, so this $85,000 number would actually find it being closer to I got that info after I made this slide, but probably closer to forty or fifty thousand dollars after netting out the um, sale of the existing vehicle. Uh, Parks and Rec had talked about um, adding some uh, more picnic tables over by the pavilion uh, area, especially if we're going to start renting out. Um, and this is probably a high cost, um, especially if we're going to start renting out some of that area. Um, the Narver Cycling Club asked that we roll over the continued expenditure we have for our portion of the mainline Greenway. Uh, maybe at the next council meeting or something, I can talk more about where that project uh, is at. Um, the biggie in the capital fund that the um, infrastructure committee discussed uh, last week is uh, replacing the uh, channel and the uh, pedestrian bridge where Elmwood Avenue um, dead ends uh, over by uh, by Windwood Road. Um, I will note this cost includes two things. Uh, the bridge part is about 50000 and the channel part is about $150,000. Uh, the channel part is, according to the borough engineer, absolutely essential that we do. Um, the bridge part, however, um, that's, I'm not going to call it discretionary. I mean, I know a lot of people use it, but, you know, if you wanted to, uh, you know, save some money somewhere temporarily, um, you could consider putting that off. Um, the Burns Pollution Reduction Plan, we are uh, unfortunately uh, well behind on. Uh, thankfully, I got news that uh, this morning, uh, or yesterday morning, 
that DEP has extended its uh, permits um, for stormwater for two years to municipalities. Oh, that's good. Word. Um, but to, you know, just I don't know, just with all the staffing changes at the borough and everything, I I don't think we've accomplished any of our uh, pollution reduction plan items that we told DEP we were going to do in 2020. Um, so to get started on that. Um, we are doing bump outs this year. We told DEP we were going to do 24 bump outs. We're doing four this year. Um, another thing we told them we would do is basically is create a stormwater uh, BMP best management practice uh, over by 80 Windsor. Um, over, um, if you're walking from the parking lot towards the back of 80 Windsor and you look to your right, there's like an open grassy sort of area there. Um, we basically said we would put a rain garden there. So. Um, our public works manager got quotes from Shriner to kind of clear that area out to do the rain garden, and then public works would, uh, you know, get the plantings and plant the rain garden there. Uh, public works frequently has to rent a core drill for projects they do, and so it's ultimately determined it'll be cheaper in the long run for the borough to just buy a core drill instead of renting it every time. Didn't have the info as of this slide, but uh, again, this week I found out the estimated cost of that would be uh, $3,500. Uh, highway aid fund, that's the state gas tax money that we uh, get uh, that we can use for road maintenance. Um, there are no requests for that fund. Um, uh, as we talked about an infrastructure, um, I really don't want to do any road paving until we know for sure that the sewer and stormwater pipes are where they need to be because I don't want to pave a road just for the road have to tear it up when the sewer line or stormwater line uh, fails. Um, I feel pretty good talking to Public Works that in 2024 we'll be in a position to start uh, paving and uh, we'll, you know, uh, I think we have a pretty aggressive plan talking with infrastructure to get that done over a two or three year period to get the um, our uh, road paving plan from 2020 implemented and get us back on schedule with that. Uh, so the Green Fund. Um, so the biggest reason I, I would agree with folks that I think we need the Green Fund is the way that borough budgeting works is anything within a fund is basically use it or lose it. And so what we've been doing in past years is we've been allocating $10,000 generally for climate action plan implementation. And a number of the things that we want to do in terms of that implementation cost more than $10,000. However, our EAC and uh, PHS, our Public Health and Safety Committee, they don't have the ability to build up any money because they don't have their own their own fund for that money. So any of that ten thousand that doesn't get spent a year, it basically goes back into you know the pot, and then council has to reallocate money the next year. So if they had the green fund, any excess revenues they had in a given year. Um, would carry over to the next year and they could build up money that could be used for um, you know bigger ticket things out of the climate action plan. So uh, some of the specific requests uh, that came my way um, for it, uh, council as part of the um, police and um, public works vehicles, um, given that temporarily the police will have uh, some gas powered vehicles and public works with Technology this time we're going to have to get gas car vehicles are uh, making a uh, carbon uh, offset contribution, <coughs> uh, which were reviewed with the EAC. Um, another idea that the, uh, that's come my way is, um, and this might change depending on what happens. We're going to talk at our next meeting about community choice aggregation, um, but an idea was giving people a financial incentive to. Um, switch to um, renewable energy, basically the borough would offset the cost difference between traditional, you know, um, non-renewable electricity and the uh, cost for someone to get a uh, renewable supplier. Um, so the idea was we would allocate um, $100, uh, you know, next year for each uh, household that proved that they had, uh, were using a renewable uh, supplier up to the first uh, 200, so it, you know, you know, it would be great if there are more than 200 people that are doing it, but um, I think it gives people an incentive to let the borough know sooner than later they've done it, and we'll also put a cap so the budget doesn't get destroyed by it, potentially. Um, 
I heard some comments and, uh, and requests I thought was a good idea of uh, considering um, in terms of multimodal transportation, uh, some benches along uh, Windsor Avenue, because uh, right now uh, um, a hold up from people being able to make more use of walking around town, especially that area, uh, is a lack of benches along that route. Um, Oh, looks like I accidentally repeated the mainline greenway, so we can take that out of the uh, capital fund and, uh, and go over here. Uh, and then the biggest uh, expense we're looking at, um, this is something that PHS has been talking about for quite a while, um, is creating a curbside, is starting to install some curbside electric vehicle uh, chargers in the borough um, for people who do not have driveways or otherwise the ability to install them uh, themselves to make use of them. Uh, we did a lot of research with uh, Flow, the company that provides EV chargers, as to what might be ideal locations uh, for them. And we identified six locations in the borough that will potentially be ideal for them um, based upon a both it's almost a, 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 an oxymoron, but I swear there are locations like this in the borough where there aren't a lot of driveways, but there also is enough on-street parking that um, that we wouldn't be, do, you know, as people make the change to EVs, we won't be disrupting people's ability uh, to park on the street. Um, there is one location we proposed that I do think maybe cuts a little too close in regards to that. Uh, there would be one proposed over um, over near where Insignia and Ryan Christopher's are, and that's a pretty heavily uh, parked area. And so far, the borough has not. Uh, one of the things the parking committee is working on is trying to broker agreements with private uh, property owners to allow for public parking. And unfortunately, I have not made much headway with the property owner of Insignium yet on that. Um, so I would suggest that um, from both a budget standpoint, um, and this is net of grant funding we would get from both uh, DEP and uh, PICO for it, um, I would suggest maybe eliminating uh, that one. Um, the other thing I'll offer, you know, we had decided when we did the two EV chargers we have that the fees would be set just to cover the borough's uh, operating expenses to encourage use and adoption of them. Um, council could, uh, you know, either now or in the future, could change those fees to also include the installation costs for the chargers um, to help over time recoup some of those upfront expenses. Um, but again, that's kind of a policy decision above, uh, above my pay grade. Uh, and then finally, there, there, this is just a more informational note, the police pension fund. Um, again, we don't really have any uh, real control over that. It's just, it's included in our budget. Uh, it's just because it's technically, you know, the part of our financial picture. Um, I don't necessarily want to talk about next steps yet. I think I'd rather maybe get into some of the weeds here and then we can talk about what the next steps look like if that is okay. All right. So that's a, a lot to digest. Mm -hmm. Questions on uh, specific topics that were a general question. Like, any questions for Samantha this one? Surely there are some. <laughs> I'm just, just going to pause. I'll just say that was, you know, it's just a, such a great presentation, I guess. <laughs> um, or, uh, or I spent longer talking than I meant to and I lost the crowd. Um, I guess so the biggest thing I need from council, I mean, if you think of questions, I'm happy to answer them, or if you think of questions after the meeting, whether you're a member of council or a member of the public, uh, please feel free to reach out to me with them. Um, the biggest thing I need tonight from council, though, is some sort of sense of, especially in the general fund, what is your tolerance, if any, for going into fund balance? And in regards to these requests we've received, specifically in, uh, you know, in all the funds, um, you know, what your, um, if there are any of the requests that you would have apprehension about um, approving or if there are things that you'd be like, oh, we absolutely need to fund, you know, this request. Well, I don't know. I'm not sure we're going to be able to hash that all out tonight. So I, I think that the procedure in the past has been, you know, if you have concerns that, you know, 
that aren't going to be addressed at the meeting, you email That's true. Samantha, That's right. you email me, and you email Cindy. But I'll put all three. Cindy is the chair of FNA, me as president, and Samantha. Just email all of us so we all know what the sort of topics of concern are. And then at the next meeting, we can focus in on the items that are sort of controversial and you know just not worry about the majority. You know, if there's requests that everybody on council is comfortable with, we just move on with those and, and talk about the ones that people have concerns about. Anyway, fire up. So uh, just a, a point of clarification, um, I guess I should have asked this infrastructure. If we don't if we don't do the bridge, the pedestrian bridge, if there's no bridge, we can't reuse the existing one, I take it. No, we cannot. Okay. So that's a big deal. Okay. Yeah. And then the other ones that seem like maybe they're a little bit, there's a little bit of flexibility on is the ones where you gave us two choices for personnel. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I think we have, we have to hear maybe a little bit more about like what the trade-offs are between those two choices. Yeah. But I mean, those seem like fairly large, you know, amounts. Maybe the maybe it's like it might be as much as you know, one hundred thousand or seventy-five thousand dollars between the two of them. Sure. So the main trade-off I'm concerned about is, um, you know, given that we did advertise them for a part-time parking controller uh, earlier this year, is I think anytime you're doing a part-time job, I worry about uh, candidate quality, and I also worry about, um, you know, uh, employee retention with a part-time employee versus a part-time employee. <laughs> Um, so that would definitely be part of it. Um, the other part of it is, um, well, first of all, parking enforcement. I mean, it's literally a job where the more time they have, you know, the more they can, the more they can do of it. And while it obviously isn't intended to be a revenue-based job, like our our goal of parking enforcement is just that people park the way they should, and we just, you know, we have to charge the fees because that's what motivates people to do what they should do. Um, Obviously, the more someone's working, the more opportunity they're going to have to write tickets, or um, or uh, the more mindful people are going to be about paying the meters and that kind of thing. So there'll be more revenue um, from it. Um, the other thing I would say too with that is, um, you know, again, the Nelson Nygaard study uh, said that we actually should have two uh, full-time uh, parking employees. I think we probably were okay for the few months that we had, for the couple months we had a part-time, full-time person. Um, but again, I do know that the uh, that it was um, it was tough. It was a tough candidate pool. I mean, the, the only reason we were able to even get the part-time person was because that person had originally interviewed for the full-time job, and we then said, "Hey, would you be open to doing uh, part-time?" and um, and hence, that's how we got anyone for a part-time uh, role in that. Uh, Public Works, it's, um, again, I think the specific sort of stuff they're looking to accomplish, um, you know, I, the Public Works manager told me that a, a part-time would be fine. But again, I kind of get into some questions about what sort of candidate are you going to get if it's a, a part-time versus a full-time role. Um, and it could be those fears are unfounded. It could be, you know, we put advertising out for it and we, you know, get someone, I don't know, like the ideal candidate if you're looking part-time would be someone who either recently retired and just, you know, only wants to do 20 hours a week or something like that, or, you know, who knows what. So. I mean, I also raised some concerns when the part-time requests came out that, you know, having a sort of a permanent employee at 25 hours a week is, seems somewhat exploitative, right? I mean, you're not paying their, their benefits in any way. It's the big savings is, you, well, we're not paying the benefits. So if it's if it's a crossing guard who's working ten hours a week, yeah, fair enough. But if it's somebody who's twenty five hours a week and it's a permanent job, it's starting to cross over. Well, not everybody needs benefits. Yeah. And again, if there were a possibility of having someone who wanted to be like a crossing guard and a thirty hour a week parking controller, that would make a full time position. I yeah, mean, so no that's... Way, there may be other combinations. I mean. I don't know the part-time public works, like half-time public works, half-time parking so, problem might be a, a str hard person to find, but you know. So we actually, um, uh, those are great points. Uh, and actually some of those have been uh, explored in the past. So um, originally the candidate who was going to do, uh, who was our part-time parking controller, was offered that position because he had past experience being a crossing guard. 
And that was kind of what we had sort of envisioned with him, and that, again, ultimately didn't work out. But that, to get some merit to the idea you're throwing out there, um, so that's true, that is an option. Um, and actually, I did try, I talked with our public works manager and the police sergeant about the viability of, okay, instead of hiring two part-time people, what if we just brought in one full-time person who had split time uh, between these roles? And we weren't able to make the scheduling with it work, um, um, but it is something that, um, it is something that we've definitely had conversations about. And I think there's, you know, I think, I think there is some merit to both of those ideas, absolutely. So let me make another comment, because you were concerned about how much fund balance to, to wear down. Mm -hmm. And it strikes me that there are some things in this general fund request that are one-time expenses and some that are ongoing. And I guess I would feel more comfortable about taking the fund balance for one-time expenses. But if it's an ongoing expense, it's just going to hit us next year. So, I mean, if you could tease those out, that might help us understand. I know there's not a lot of them, but there no, are no, no. some. I, I mostly agree with that. Again, the one caveat I'd like to emphasize for council and the public in regards to ongoing expenses is that, um, again, we do have you know, 100 ports under construction, 203 Haverford, and, um, and, you know, and at some point, 650 um, Montgomery, that will provide significant ongoing uh, revenue to oh, the right, yeah. And so, I don't know, maybe what, maybe what we decide is maybe some of these requests, we say, okay, well, once 100 ports and 203 Haverford come online, and we actually know and have the revenue on hand from those, we kind of have a tentative kind of agreement that I can then come to council and request you know, that funding. Right, I just, I guess I'm saying is I have no problem with where, you know, taking the fund balance down for the one-time expenses. Mm -hmm. So if we're gonna run a structural deficit of $200,000, that's a problem every year, right. you know. Yeah. But, but it's, it's only in the last five. I had the same reaction I when, I when I saw that number. It's, it's certainly big enough that we need to yeah. think twice. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Anyone else have any specific? Questions or comments? <coughs> okay, so yeah, like I said, when you, you know, once you've had time to digest some of the, the line items, I think reach out to uh, to Cindy and I and Samantha and tell them, tell us all um, your thoughts on any of these that uh, perhaps should be postponed and uh, what seems like. Yeah. Let's just, just talk about the ones that, that may need to be, maybe, maybe best post up. And then just to emphasize as well, like I said, just a final reminder, um, and the request from the fire company, um, we'll talk about with PHS and then uh, what more info uh, for council in the future on that. Did the library give you anything other than uh, inflation? Or did they make your breakdown there? Um, they gave me their whole proposed 2023 budget, yeah. So council uh, wants to see that, I'm happy. If council or anyone from the public wants to see that, I'm happy to provide it. Okay, yes. So it's there if we need it. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, do we need to discuss the EIT scenarios at all now, or what was the? Oh, yeah, that's right. Um, thank you for reminding me about that. So based on our discussion at the last council meeting, um, this 2023, these budget proposals include a half percent um, EIT. And, um, and uh, you know, the borough put out, uh, for the residents trying to break a complex situation down into some, what we would think would be relatively common scenarios for people, and in terms of how the EIT, um, uh, the, you know, the changes to the felt waste fees and the homestead exemption would affect people. And I think what we're trying to show to the public that for property owners in the borough, residential property owners in the borough, you know, the, the impact would be you would either be paying less than taxes or, um, or you know, the impact would be um, much less than what it would be if we were just implementing an EIT on everyone. Um, I mean, really, we tax increase. Tax increase. I'm sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry. We, yeah, we did a property tax increase, and um, I mean, really, the main people that are, uh, you know, and this is you know myself, the main the main losers in this proposal, if you will, in terms of having to pay more 
uh, new taxes are non-residents who work in non-residents who live in a community that does not have an EIT that work here in Norwood Borough. Um, but like I said, I, I you know believe pretty strongly in this proposal, and um, you know if I have to put my money where my mouth is to uh, gain some credibility with council and the public on it, I'm certainly you know willing to do so. So. Um, um, so, I mean, that's the main group that I found consistently, you know, paid more in tax, because obviously they're not benefiting from the homestead exemption. Um, or the reduced millage. Or, or, the, yeah, or the reduced millage from, uh, from changing, getting rid of that and the solid waste. Um, whereas, you know, and again, you know, even for people who, um, who work in the borough and own, you know, own their, uh, live in their home that they pay property taxes on, um, unless you're, you know, a very wealthy person, the uh, homestead exemption wipes out a good chunk of the um, EIT that all or most of the EIT that people who own their home in the borough, not necessarily own their home, but you have a mortgage or own your home, people who live in a home, you know, that belongs to them uh, would have to uh, would have to pay. Uh, so we, we did get one comment that um, that we were maybe underestimating the complexity of administering such a system, mm -hmm. and but I believe you have a provider that does this, so maybe you could clarify that point. Sure. So um, yeah, I mean, the, I mean, I didn't have to implement it, but the last time I worked and had an EIT, like we tell almost every town in PA has an EIT. And uh, yeah, I mean, every now and then someone would call the borough office with an EIT question and we would tell them, here's the number for a keystone and, uh, <laughs> and, you know, and send them to that. And I mean, that's the same way with a lot of services in borough. Like I mentioned earlier, it calls out, you know, understandably we get calls out trash service or, or, um, or even things like the water service. That's probably a better example. We get calls about, you know, a question about that and we tell people, oh, you need to call Aqua to take care of that. So yeah, I'm sure, especially in the first year of it, there'd probably you know, be a learning curve for residents where we get a certain number of calls with questions. But again, it would just be a matter of directing people to, uh, to Berkheimer, who's the county EIT collector, to, to address those. I mean, that's part of you know, what Berkheimer gets, uh, gets paid to do. So, um, and then the, um, you know, the other thing I would see, especially in the first year, is again, we'll want to be really cognizant. You know, I think we've already tried to be cognizant about public notice about this, um, but I think especially if council does move forward with it, again, we'll want to send out further notice to people that, hey, this is coming. Even then, you know, my cynical side kind of says, I'm sure we'll get some calls that are, um, you know, oh, no one at the borough, you know, told me that this was, this was happening. And, you know, and with those folks, we'll do our best, you know, to kind of explain the thought process that went into it. So, in the first year, yeah, there, there might be a little bit, but um, I don't think it would be overwhelming. And I think after the first year, you know, people would kind of understand what's going on, and, and I think it'd be a lot less um, after the first year. Oh, Andrew, I see your hand up. I do have a question. Um, I got a, a, a request from a resident who, who um, in, in the initial writings, it seemed like it was saying that people who pay the Philadelphia wage tax or, or uh, won't will be exempt from this. But if they make income outside of Philadelphia, that's not taxed, not subject to that, they will be subject to an EIT on that income, correct? That is correct. So, so we can't exclude everybody who pays Philadelphia wage tax because there could be, I don't know, a percentage of them that make money in two areas. I guess with all due respect, I guess I would question how many people would actually fall into a category like that. A lot of people work at So just a, a point of clarification um, is that people who... Um, Ever since the pandemic, the Philadelphia Department of Revenue um, graciously uh, decided that people who are working from home, uh, uh, they're, uh, if they're in a community of EIT, that money is um, allocated to that community, but we can't promise that for forever. But it's it, for people who are working from home, the EIT or wage taxes 
again, Philadelphia DOR got a little weird with it since the pandemic. But the way it's supposed to work is you're supposed to pay it, um, um, you know, to where your office actually is. But the point being is that even in people working from home, their tax burden is not changing. Just instead of you know, it's just a matter of where the money's going to Philly or going to um, the borough in that scenario. Actually, it'd be less if they're paying. Yeah, that's true. It's only higher percent. It's not the yeah. Yeah, three yeah. point whatever it is now. Yeah. 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 No, because we don't have to calculate it. Berkheimer calculates it. So it's not anything the borough has to do. Yeah, they, they do it for the entire county. It's, each county has their own provider. And in this case, Berkheimer. Uh, but I mean, the, the, the specific case in hand, there, 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 there's two examples. So my employer says I'm working at home by choice and they take all my 4.2%, okay? There are other employers that allow you to report the number of days that you don't work in Philadelphia and they give you a refund, okay, for that amount. Somehow, if, if, you know, if we were to really do this right, but I don't even know how the accounting would work, we would have to know about that amount that they got as a refund and charge the IKEA that. But I don't know if that's possible for yeah. Berkheimer to do. Well, it's, I, well, we can check with Berkheimer. Well, I think we're, sorry, go ahead. Well, and I can just say that this was an issue that came up when I was working because people worked in a lot of different locations. Mm -hmm. And we actually had to record how many hours we spent in different locations. And it was our employer's responsibility to make sure that was reported to whoever needed to collect tax from us. So, so there was something that happened behind the scenes that the employee didn't have to do anything with. And yeah, but so, that's not how it works in this case. There's a form you fill out for all the days you didn't work in Philadelphia. And if your employer like says that you didn't do that, which Penn won't do anymore, okay, but I think Cindy was saying Drexel does that, and you can you can not pay tax on city tax on that amount. Yeah. But I don't know. But it's the employer employee's responsibility. I'm not sure how they would even get trusted. Let's, let's, let's so the purpose. Of well, no, well, no. So, I, well, let me clarify one thing maybe before we commit to that. All right. So the analysis we did on the EIT revenue, they basically assumed anyone working at Philly, the borough is not getting any of that money. Right. And so, from the borough standpoint, we've already assumed if we got any of that money, that would be great. That would be a bonus. And from the perspective of the people who are paying it, again, they're paying it to somebody. In this case, it's just a matter of, of who. So your tax burden is not going to go up because you're working you know, in that situation. Now, the mayor's case, yeah, if you're working, if you have a job in Philly and you have a second completely different job, you know, that's based out of Narver, then yeah, you're gonna pay you're gonna pay EIT on that Narver job. And just just as a functional question, earned income taxes is like taxes that you actually work for. So it's not investment income uh, or income like that. Uh, correct? Is it? Does it? I, I'm unclear as to whether it applies to income earned from uh, rental properties that you may own. <laughs> so I would encourage um, for questions like that. Um, there's we created a page on the borough website dedicated to the EIT, and as some of those materials I had Berkheimer review um, before we put it out there. So I would encourage um, anyone who has any questions about about the EIT to look at that web page first, and then if there are any additional questions, definitely feel free to follow up with uh, with me about it. All right. Any other budget questions? All right. Uh, so we have our, our step. Our next move is the budget to pass along information about specific items to discuss later. Uh, item 18. <laughs> Admin office lobby. My favorite subject. <laughs> Uh, let me get my screen shared here for the benefit of the public as well as uh, council. Um, so as
So I mean, we've had, uh, oh, let me zoom in a little bit here. Why it's being uh, difficult here. Here we go. All right, so uh, you know we've had some discussions with council and finance administration about the recommendation from our now both workers' comp and liability insurer about uh, providing a more uh, secured uh, entryway to um, the administrative office, and uh, we've also talked about the very understandable desire of council, um, you know, not to make it um, un unwelcoming um, to members of the public. Um, so this is similar to the design council had last time I asked um, our building inspector to tell me how big could we make these windows and not uh, create any structural or code issues. And, uh, and this is the uh, design uh, that I got for, uh, for council to consider. So, so I know a lot of this design is coming out of sort of concerns that I raised and other people raised about you know, the exterior. So what is the advantage of like this? Right now you've got kind of a vestibule, right? You come in through a door and you're in a small space with a bench and some chairs, and then you've got the windows in front of you to interact with borough staff, right? There's a, there's a, they're in a small room. What's the advantage of having that small room rather than sort of the hallway to be the interaction point with the borough staff? You're talking, so you're saying what's the what's the difference between this and what we're doing right now? No, I'm saying I think originally you had some pictures that were you know this kind of wall, but at the hallway level. Like instead of so right now you 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 come into the hallway, you come into a little entry room kind of, and then you have the yeah. So you've got the entry room with the couch. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, let me get inside. There's a better uh, yeah. There's like a better. So we never look at these. Yeah, that one works. So what, what's the advantage of having this room rather than having kind of the access from the hallway? Because right now you're, you're cutting into the space of that work area. Yeah, so this little I guess I, um, I'm sorry, I guess I don't understand what you mean about access from the hallway. Well, like, I'm trying to picture, isn't, isn't the, I mean, if you put the windows on the back, you know, on the back wall of where that guy is, isn't that the, that's would the that be hallway? That's, no, that's that wall, right there. That's what the wall. That's the exterior wall. Yeah, like, this unfortunately, the way the, the building, wall. yeah, like, yeah, really, like, I'm just confused about the layout, I guess. It's the, that's the exterior wall. All right. yeah. I think you're thinking of the fact that, you know, when you come in, it's like, it feels like there's more space there but that's all the steps going into the building. Okay. Uh, yeah. Maybe I'm just not picturing the entry properly. All right. Yeah. Never mind. Yeah. I'm with all my concerns. Yeah. I mean, yeah. well, now I'm really confused. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the door is the same in the same location. Yeah. Yes. And so, so on the other side of these doors is where the bathrooms are, right? But in this, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you're just you're just taking a few feet from your current office to create this. Yeah. This to And I mean, the wall doesn't go all the way up. Is there a reason? It does not. It um, it goes about. I guess it looks like. Well, I guess there's measurements probably on the first picture, but it looks like it's about seven feet up. Yeah, instead of guessing, I'll go back to the first uh, picture that actually has some measurements. Or like there's a, well, get that view in the app. Sorry about viewing anyone motion sickness here. Now we just have measurements for the, uh, for the window. Yeah. 
not sensing a lot of excitement and enthusiasm <laughs> for this. I mean, all of it, I don't feel a lot of excitement and enthusiasm for this either. It's just that um, our current setup, uh, you know, is, is not really good either. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think it's been a struggle with the way the building is laid out to find mm -hmm. something that meets the goals that, you know, council has, has asked us to try and meet with this. Mm -hmm. okay. Have we asked, I don't know, there are a couple architects, I think, on the planning commission. Have we asked any of them? Because I think this is all done by, engineer or someone like someone so so like from a very kind of just technical okay this is what you asked yeah. for here's because I, I i just i kind of wonder is there any way i mean it is awkward the way you come in to i mean the fact that you walk in and look right at bathroom doors is weird <laughs> that design is strange is there is there anything that they would say well you could like is there a portion of a wall that could be taken out that could allow a different Entry, I don't know. So it's where I'm like, I, to me, it's like an architect would be the one to ask for something like that. So I just wondered if we considered that. So um, I did share with uh, the staff that year the uh, direction from council in prior meetings to try and incorporate uh, that feedback. Um, but I have to verify uh, what, how they, how they did or did not solicit that feedback. <laughs> okay. Because <laughs> I'm just, I don't know. You just see so many things done with buildings these days where people are able to ship things around in ways that I can't picture because I'm not, you know, it's not my job, not my skill set. So maybe it's, I don't know, maybe it's somewhere, um, right, yeah, I can, um, I think it might be at this point, while well, I appreciate the work they've done, I think it might be at this point time to, um, you know, take uh, Yerkes uh, out of the loop on this and, um, you know, maybe I'll have, um, Michelle Carroll, my assistant, uh, contact, uh, you know, folks like either Todd Bressy or Dave Brower, um, or Jim Cornwell, uh, directly and see, uh, see what sort of advice they have on how we could try and meet the needs of the staff and, uh, and the, and council and the public. Yeah. yeah I think some, some volunteer advice would be good here if we can get some. Yeah. So your piece has been fairly expensive trying to sort through this process. I think there's been, People haven't been happy with, uh, with what's come out of it. Um, so. Oh, hello. hey. Um, also, uh, Heidi Boys on the Planning Commission might be able to offer you some good advice. Yeah. This is her, definitely yeah. Heidi's alley. This is her kind of thing that she's mm -hmm. interior kind of, yeah, space reorganization. Mm -hmm. uh, she works a lot with older properties, so she thinks mm -hmm. about how to, yeah. you know, how to move things around that again are constrained. Yeah. yeah, I think I I took me this long to finally figure out where this partition is. I finally got it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Really, really well, challenged me. I get it. <laughs> We've looked at it a lot in F&A, and that's why I'm like, I know what this is. is. Okay. You know, I'm like, well, yeah. Yeah. And I had the same feeling you did when you first saw Mongo. completely baffled. Like, yes. I mean, you're, oh. I just couldn't make it in my head. Like, now I finally figure out, oh, I see what it is. Yes. It's that. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, sorry, Samantha, but it sounds like a... Well, no, like I said, I mean, when I said all men, like, I, you know, did not hold a, a ton of enthusiasm for this design either. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, again, you can post your case, I mean, they did their best to do what, like, what I told them to do, interpreting what council had said. So it's certainly no, uh, you know, no fault of theirs in, in that regard. Yeah, that's, uh, but, yeah, we just, so, we're getting what they could provide us, which is yeah. this. I mean, I know when we looked at, at the four photos from a month ago, there was, I was, I called them from my computer now, I remember the plan, it was Swarthmore. Phoenixville, Limerick, and Lower Saucony. It's Saucony? How do you say Saucony. Lower Saucony? I don't, I've never known how to say that. Um, and we looked at those. I mean, I think that, even though I can't pronounce it, the, the way that Lower Saucony had it, you know, it, was, it was something that appealed to, it, I know it appealed to, to council members. I think we should just, just like, you did put the picture in there, which means I interpret it as being something that's not beyond the pale. It's not something you wouldn't consider. It doesn't have like a transaction window, right? It has a, a barrier that's it's in the form of like it's an, a desk type space that's in it, right? It's not like a bank desk, I'm going to lower, you know. 
um, like a, I don't know, um, there's something appealing about that because it's just nice and open and it feels like it, you know, plainly provides a, bar a barrier that a person can just you know, walk right in. Um, but it's not, it doesn't provide as much separation as, as a wall on a window. Um, it may not need to be cut out of the office the same way it could almost get to be. Oh, remember where the old, old face tie barrier was? Yeah, the L shaped one. It could almost be like, it was, there used to be like an L shaped, I don't even know how you describe it. It was like a, it was like a waist high, it was like a teller high, like a teller high was, tower, right? Yeah. It was like an L shape, so you'd come in the opposite, it would be that way, and then it just kind of, yeah. So it, it kept you from getting around right. a little bit more than what you have now, but um, it, it also, but it also didn't allow much space. If more than a couple people from the public came in, that was a crowded little right. area. It was not a direct, you couldn't, it wasn't any gap. No place to sit down. So if you were an older person who, or someone who just, you know, they, I don't know, had foot surgery, you couldn't right. sit anywhere. It was right. not the best, but it was, it wasn't terrible. It just wasn't the best. Sorry, yeah, so thank you for the direction. Yeah. Sure. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's move on to our action items. Um, so 9A is the uh, resolution we discussed about the grants. Uh, let's move to make a minute. We have to make a motion to vote on this. Okay. I move that um, we consider resolution 2022-21 to apply for the Pico Green Energy Grant for the Master for Master Park Planning. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Is there any discussion of this? One question. I just wanted to clarify. Is there a matching with this? Because there is. So there's a. Um, it's a 50-50 grant, but we're allowed to match it with the DCNR fund. Thank you, because I wondered when you said our outlay would only be $4,000, we got both of these, I was like, I'm not, I'm confused now. <laughs> but I remember there's a match, so thank you. Right. Uh, any other questions? All right, so let's vote on this resolution uh, and to apply for the Pico Green Region Grant. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Uh, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, uh, I think. I guess we lost Bob. Uh, so, 550. Okay. Uh, let's move on to 9B. So, hiring. <coughs> oh, I thought I'd remake the motion first and then I'd explain how we're Good point. Uh, so, I'd like to make a motion. I move that we consider hiring Maury Mead as a public works crew person. Can I ask you to rephrase that to maybe confirm the hiring? Oh. To consider. Oh, okay. I move that we confirm the hiring of Maury Mead as a public works crew person. Is there a second? Okay. Go on, discussion. Yeah, and thank you for that uh, clarification. Um, the, with the uh, borough manager ordinance, the reason we're voting on this tonight is um, uh, I'm given the power to make hiring decisions within borough council has to confirm that decision at its next public meeting. Yeah. Um, so as you may remember at your last uh, meeting, uh, you had to vote to accept the uh, resignation of Mike Wozniak from our public works crew. Um, so after doing a um, search for uh, his replacement, um, our public works manager found Maury Mead. Um, I was impressed, if you look at his resume, he um, has been with the same employer since he, you know, even before he graduated high school um, for about 10 years now. And about every two or three years, he got promoted to more a uh, position of more responsibility. Um, so I thought that was uh, really encouraging. Um, he brings a skill set that's currently missing uh, to public works in regards to uh, automotive maintenance. So one of the uh, tasks that Jeff would have for him among other regular public works duties is making sure, especially if we're getting these new vehicles, that both the public works and police vehicles that we're getting are um, you know kept in good shape and will offset the um, aim of a new vehicle. Even the minimal maintenance costs you would have, we'll be able to offset a lot of that by uh, having Mari on the public works team. Um, so I certainly uh, support it, and I uh, hope uh, council agrees. <laughs> and just to clarify the budgetary impact, this is already assumed. This this hire is already baked into the current budget, right? Mm -hmm. It is correct. Okay. Any other questions? 
All right, uh, let's vote uh, to confirm the hiring of Lauren Heaney as public works crew person. All those in favor? Aye. Okay, motion passes 5-0. Uh, let's move on to committee reports. Infrastructure. Um, so, um, <laughs> yeah, infrastructure's okay. first. Um, and I'm going to focus on um, the, the borough hall energy audits. I think most of the other topics we've already discussed uh, as part of the budget request. Um, so um, Panoni presented their uh, their audit report for borough hall. Um, they focused on electric powered and gas powered equipment and the building envelope. And they said that when they compared to similar buildings that our energy usage is relatively low and better than Energy Star standards. Um, the lighting was inventory, and it's fairly clear that an LED a replacement uh, project would uh, have a very quick payoff. Um, they also um, discussed the windows, and um, while there is some leakage on the windows, the payback period for replacing the windows is 150 years. And um, uh, the Pannoni person suggested there might be other uh, solutions involving sealing the windows better that would be a better choice for us at this time. The boiler um, is at end of life, and but unfortunately the the uh, sort of electric boilers aren't really available uh, yet. And uh, she suggested that you're replacing the boiler with a natural gas boiler would be the easiest and least expensive alternative. However, um, the general consensus is we want to uh, try try to wait. So at our next meeting, we're going to hear a little bit more um, from Pannoni about like how quickly we can replace it if it completely failed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm cheerful. All right. Well, sorry. Yeah, and then I guess we, thank you. It's good to know. We talked about the bridge. Um, uh, we talked about the uh, Elmwood Avenue Bridge already. And then um, there's a plan in place to uh, replace the uh, front uh, area in front of uh, this building with concrete um, so that it's graded properly and the water doesn't flow into the building. Um, <laughs> and so the, the rusty steps are, are replaced and graded and there's a little rain garden that's going to be created in that planter. Um, and then, uh, the, well, you already mentioned the, the stormwater uh, bump out that, that contract has been awarded. All right. Um, so what about the funding for that project, the uh, Burrow Hall project that you're discussing, is that, uh, that going to be in the next year's budget? Is that part of the years in this the capital fund now? Uh, no, it's uh, covered under the um, under the borrowing for um, repairs for under Conway. Okay. Oh, and I should just add that we can't replace the the carpet in the front hallway until we do this project because it's just going to get wet again. Yeah. Good to tell us that. All right. <laughs> uh, questions. All right. Uh, finance and administration. Somebody is not here, so. We did not come prepared to talk about it because I. Maybe I didn't think of that. Thank you. Yes, I didn't even think of that. I didn't, that. I didn't know. Well. I remember, but it's been a while since I learned it. Maybe between our two memories, we can piece together. Yeah. Yeah. We already did. We already discussed at the last. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you have the since then. No wonder I can't. This is what happens when you're out of the bar for two weeks. You forget things. Okay. Public health and safety probably the same thing. Yeah, we're meeting tomorrow morning at 8, so I can update everyone after that. Okay. Uh, and then our parking. It's the same as today. <laughs> um, we have not met since our last council meeting, but our next meeting is a week from tomorrow at 8 a.m., October 14. All right. And I was expecting to have a discussion about the uh, uh, aesthetic guidelines for the barriers, but the two people who've been most interested in that kind of. I uh, know that's research. on uh, that's on the agenda for the uh, 20th. All right, great. Okay. So that was fun. Everybody's favorite topic. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, the, the research has been done, so hopefully we're we're getting closer to a decision point. Um, <laughs> announcements for the good council. Uh, Yes, Council oh, has an open house uh, tomorrow, which is also First Friday. Uh, there will be a uh, fire pit and a safety uh, and s'mores with uh, the fire department. 
uh, kind of at the side of Borough Hall, right? And uh, council will be there as well. We'll be discussing you know, any topics of uh, interest to the community. Just come on over and uh, enjoy First Friday. Time. That is between <laughs> seven and eight. Okay, that is between seven and eight, and then First Friday in general will be like six to nine-ish, I think. Uh, and that will include, you know, art exhibits through the downtown and uh, various stores staying open late. So check it out. Come and say hello to us. If there's any other announcements? Okay. Uh, we will be having an executive session uh, to discuss a personnel matter related to employee compensation and a personnel matter related regarding a job description. And I do not believe we will return uh, after this uh, executive session. I have a motion to adjourn. So moved. For a second. Okay. okay. Uh, all those in favor of adjourning? Okay, we are adjourning. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Right, we'll take a take a couple minutes here and uh, right, two two minute break. Okay.